So somewhere you've been drawn along this path of spirituality and knowing more about yourself through meditation. Yeah. And uh, was, there, was there teachers that were influencing you at that time? Or was this more a kind of a, a, a lone path in finding your own direction? Well, my uh, middle class conditioning finally got the better of me and, and, and like gravity drew me back and insisted if you're going to do all this kind of nonsense, you have to do it properly. And it took me off to a university to study philosophy and psychology. Okay. So I came back into the mould again, but uh, albeit in a different direction that I was supposed to go, my business schools and economics. Um, but it was so dry and uninspiring, I sort of... Um, well, part of that was a study of Eastern religions again, and, and this time studying of Buddhism. And, um, but the, the rest of it was pretty academic and pretty dry, and, it, and it, I was sort of losing my way, if you like. The, the, sort of, the, the blossoming was, it was beginning to crumple back up again. But part of, part of it, I remember um, reading um, Buddhist philosophies, there was a quote from the Buddha, and um, he was talking about enlightenment. And of course, enlightenment means uh, many things to many people. But to me, enlightenment was finally to be sort of released from all the conditioning, which meant ultimate freedom, wisdom. Sounded like a good idea. Um, and there was one quote the Buddha said that you can be enlightened within seven years, seven months, seven weeks, seven days, seven hours, seven minutes, seven seconds. And being young and full of energy, I'm totally misunderstood and thought, maybe seven days. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's when I decided to, uh, I'd already learned a bit about meditation in the communities, but I'd, I, by this time I was studying Buddhist books on things like vipassana, watching the mind and the sensations of the mind and the body, etc. So I decided to practice um, for a week doing intense meditation. I was practicing on my own. And so I had it all laid out, got the food in and started meditating. And I remember it was, it was um, summer. And the birds were noisy, could hear the traffic in the background, could hear people's voices. Too many distractions. And um, I thought, damn it, <laughs> it's going to take longer than seven days. Because <laughs> every time I started to get uh, focused, some noise would sort of disturb me, or the light would disturb me. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to do better than this. So that's when I actually, um, it was um, a built-in wardrobe, and I decided what I'll do is meditate and there will be totally quiet, and dark, almost like sensory deprivation, but in a voluntary way. So, so you kind of moved into the wardrobe. Yeah, it's like people yeah. do it now. They sort of lie in tanks of water, saline solution, float, float tanks. And not, but not for seven days, though. Uh, it would be seven-day retreat, so it would mean I would sort of come out for food, and I would, okay. I would come out to sleep. Yeah, okay. But, but okay. the rest of the time, I would be sort of doing meditation for sort of yeah. an hour or two, and then you'd have to get up and walk around anyway because of your poor legs. Yeah. I was, those days, I could do lotus position. But even so, after two hours, you started to go a bit numb in the legs. And um, um, so I was, I was in the cupboard doing, you know, doing meditation. And um, as I was doing it, it did become very intense. It achieved. I couldn't hear anything anymore. It was dark. I put nice lots of cushions, so it was nice and soft. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I didn't have any uh, physical sensations disturbing me. And I was going into quite deep meditation. But it was unguided. I didn't have a teacher. So when I started going to, into stages of consciousness, I didn't know where, where I was and what I was doing. It was like driving through the countryside without a map. It's like, I do want to get somewhere. I'm not quite sure where it is because the te I didn't have a teacher to explain to me. Yeah. Where am I now? I'm, I don't have a map. I'd lost no grid references. And so it got to a point where uh, my body went into a, a reaction. It started to shake. It started to get nausea. Then I started to get the runs, so I had to run out of my cupboard. <laughs> a few quite, well, several times a day. Uh -huh. And it felt like everything was falling apart, and I didn't uh -huh. understand why. And later on, I actually helped run a meditation a retreat center in Oxford. And this was actually typical. I saw people go through this as beginners. So it wasn't, it wasn't peculiar to me. It was, it's actually quite a typical reaction for people getting into intense meditation in the beginning stages. They get a resistance, a bodily resistance. Uh, but for me, it, I sort of realized that I, university wasn't the place. It wasn't sort of teachers that I needed. What, what I needed to do was to find teachers of meditation, professional teachers of meditation. So that's when I just uh, packed my bag and went to London and uh, went to various Buddhist monasteries around London 
the Thais, the Sri Lankans, um, Japanese. Um, they all had strange ideas. The Sri Lankans wanted me to go back to university and, fit and get my degree because that's what they were, all the monks over here from Sri Lanka were getting sponsored to be monks in London, but they're all in university in London, which was part of the deal. Right, so yeah. of course they'd say, yeah. you know, uh, go back to university, get a degree. You know, that's the goal. And the Thais were very strange. They wanted me to learn hours and hours of chanting off by heart before they'd even think about teaching me meditation. Which, uh, you know, why learn the foreign language off by heart and you know what it means for hours and hours and hours before you then get taught meditation. So that was very curious. Um, the Japanese wanted to just discuss the nature of reality and I'd been all through that through university. So it was too much discussion and not enough just getting on with meditation. And then I met a, a group of monks uh, in Hampstead who were um, American, Canadian, English. Uh, there were four of them. And they had just come back from Thailand. They'd been in the jungles of Thailand for 12 years uh, under a, a great teachers, um, Thai monk teachers. And they'd actually been sent by those teachers to, to come to London to start up a monastery. And um, that, I didn't have to go to university. I didn't have to learn lots of chanting. They didn't want to discuss intellectually the meaning of reality. Um, and um, th at that point, they ordained me as a novice monk and... So you actually became a, a, a monk, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so I was serious. So they actually said, well, you know, um, we are monks, and yeah. if you're going to be part of the community, it's just uh, it's tradition, you ordain as a novice monk. Right, yeah. And fine, okay, so I did, and um, I was there for a while, living a very simple life, learning Vipassana. Right, yeah. Focusing my mind. So, Ken, you were... Uh, yeah in the monastery mm -hmm. with the monks and it was there yeah. I think that you first started to get in, interested in acupuncture and the uh, Chinese herbs. Well it was um, a necessity because I'd forgotten the reason why I'd entered the monastery was to get teaching um, because I realized that my intensive meditation was too intense and um, I couldn't do it. But while I was in the monastery I was becoming impatient again. And I re-remembered the quote of the Buddha that I could be enlightened within seven days or seven weeks. This time I, th I was a bit more conservative. I thought, well, maybe seven months. And I started um, doing austere practices. I started going without sleep for many days and nights. And uh, so, so what happened then when you went without sleeping for many days? Just got a nasty headache. <laughs> <laughs> I got a nasty headache and my joints ached. And... Uh, um, it was strange, if you close your eyes for a second, a million thoughts flashed past and you realise you were falling into sleep. Because you need that kind of process of dreaming, don't you? You it's, certainly do. Without yeah. that, you, you, you get do. in trouble quickly. Yes, yeah. you do. Well, I mean, in, in, actually, interesting enough, in the, in, it was a forest in, in Oxford where the monastery was. And I actually did encounter a few ghosts that I didn't know about. The, the locals explained to me that would be the 13th century monks chanting that you heard when I explained I heard some sort of Gregorian chanting in the woods. I spent a lot of time walking through the forest to keep awake, day or night. And I, unbeknown to me, they were haunted forests. Had I, had I known they were haunted, I probably wouldn't have gone there. Uh, so there's various ghosts I came across. And um, so I thought they were hallucinations, but apparently the, the locals said, no, they're, they're actually <laughs> well-known ghosts that you came across. So, so you physically saw them? Or no, you... I, only, I only heard. You heard, yes. okay. I so... heard one woman screaming in another part of the forest. I thought it was foxes. But I, th I thought, no, that's, that's definitely that's one screaming. Um, I went to sort of see if I could help or what it was, but it was night time. I thought, no, it must have been foxes. But apparently a woman was at that point pulled off a horse by highwaymen huh. about 200 years ago or something. So um, that, that was strange. It's the first and only time I've ever met ghosts or traces of ghosts. But um, through my austere, austere practices, sitting under a tree through the night after night, wasn't so smart in February and March. Um, I actually got acute rheumatic condition with fever huh. and then my joints swelling up. And again, my body, if, if you like, was rebelling, was reacting. And I couldn't actually be part of the um, monastic community in the sense that I couldn't sit on the floor in lotus position and meditate. I had to sit in, in a chair at the back. And um, I went to hospital and there, through their um, various, they never asked me any questions, as they want to do. But they did do x-rays and urus, urine analysis and blood tests, etc. And they diagnosed I had an acute polyrheumatica 